<laughs> all right, thank you. Um, all right, so roll call. Do we have Dave? Dave's joining right now, and so is in Tom. Okay. So okay. is in Susan. All right. Do we have Dave? Can't hear you. Tom? June? Here. Jess? Here. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Here. And I'm here. Dave, is your audio working? Yeah. All right. Um, our next scheduled meeting of the North Middlesex Regional School Committee will be held at 7 p.m. on Monday, July 18th. Uh, consent agenda. We have approval of minutes, payable accounts, payable warrants, payroll warrants, and a handful of donations. So moved. Second. All right. We'll see Tom. Uh, Dave. Yep. Jess. Yes. June. Yes. Lisa. Yes. Randy. Yes. Susan. Yes. Tom. Yes. And I will vote yes. So that's unanimous. Thank you. <clears throat> On to uh, public communications. We had one person um, submit for public communications. Uh, Patrick McPhee from Ashby. I don't see that he's on, Craig. All right. Okay. And we will uh, proceed on. Um, next is uh, chairperson's report. Um, I don't have much other than to uh, just recognize that this is both the assistant superintendent Milligan's and uh, principal uh, Hanley from Barnum Brooks final school committee meeting as uh, Dr. Hanley's retiring and uh, Ms. Milligan is, uh, is moving on to uh, other pastures. So um, I didn't know if either of you, not to put you on the spot, but if either of you wanted to say anything or if members of the committee wanted to say anything or members of staff or administration wish to say anything, this would be the opportunity. I know from my point of view, can you hear me? Craig, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. I know from my point of view, I've enjoyed working for the North Middlesex Regional School District uh, for the last eight years. And if it wasn't for the opportunity to be closer to home with my, my children, I would probably still be here for the next eight. So I'm very pleased to have been part of this journey and I wish everyone the best. And I know that I will continue to be on emails and text threads and everything for the the foreseeable future to make sure that it's a smooth transition for Dr. Bavoa Reese. So thank you for my perspective. Uh, same, same for me. Uh, you know, I started my teaching career at, at Spalding in 1999 and uh, being back at Barnum after being the assistant principal there for, for a time uh, has been great. Um, the people there are great. Um, the parents, very supportive. Um, you know, especially these last couple of years, which were difficult, I think, for, for everybody, um, not just people in schools. So, um, you know, I appreciate all of your support. And, um, you know, I will be there through the end of uh, July. So when they hire a new principal, um, I hope to meet that person and uh, welcome them to our school. So thank you. Thank you. Susan, I saw you come off mute. Do you want to say something? Yes, no, I just wanted to say um, thank you both to Dr. Hanley and um, to um, Mrs. Milligan. Um, I think, Tara, I've known you back from the Spalding days from PTO meetings. From uh, <laughs> We won't count the years. <laughs> I started to do the math and it got too complicated, a lot of carrying numbers. And so, <laughs> but uh, sorry to uh, see you leave. Um, but um, I wish you the best of luck in the, the next step in your life. And, um, and Nancy, uh, I've enjoyed working with you um, over these years and um, have uh, appreciated. Um, I worked more closely uh, with Nancy than I have uh, to Tara. Um, certainly I've known Tara for a long time, but uh, and Nancy, I've appreciated the uh, passion with which um, I've seen you um, in this role 
and uh, that lucky district uh, that gets you next. But I get the being near the kids thing and feeling like you can make a difference in your uh, children's education. So I wish you luck and uh, I will miss you and uh, good luck in the next step. Thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, I'll, I'll echo the sentiment. Um, I enjoyed working uh, Nancy with yourself and, and, and Dr. Hanley as well. It's, uh, both my kids went to Varnum Brook. My youngest just uh, just wrapped up or is just about to wrap up his, uh, his tenure there. So uh, perfect timing. So I appreciate you uh, uh, hanging in there till my kids left. Um, and, uh, and Nancy, again, pleasure, pleasure, pleasure working with you and um, look forward to seeing more great things from, uh, from both of you as you move on. Fine. There's no hard feelings. You left right before my third came, which is probably a smart decision. <laughs> <laughs> that what it was, Tom? <laughs> Tom, I have a third too, so maybe it's both of us. <laughs> that might be right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you and, uh, and congratulations. Um, uh, Superintendent Morgan, on to your... Report. Sure. Um, thank you. And, and I'll be brief. I just obviously, uh, where it's my where it's a report, just want to open with thanking um, both Nancy and Tara for being valued members of the administrative team. Um, I value both of them uh, professionally and personally and really wish them the very best moving forward. Um, Nancy moving on to Wyndham, New Hampshire and Tara moving into retirement. So again, valued members of the team, you will both be missed. Thank you for all that you've done. Um, the only other piece we have, we have um, both, uh, we have two people leaving and we have one person joining and um, hopefully if we're back in person uh, in the fall, you'll be able to meet this person, but I would like to welcome Mr. Ryan DeMar, who has been the academic transition coordinator at the high school, uh, student supervisor at the high school, and has also coached uh, multiple sports at the high school as the new assistant principal um, joining um, the administrative team at the high school. I see that Ryan is on the call. Um, I certainly do not want to put him on the spot right now, um, but we'll certainly ask him to say a few words to the committee come the fall. So welcome to Ryan. He's, he's really been a fantastic um, addition to the high school. I think he's in his third year in the district, I believe, second or third year. And he has really stepped up because we have been down an assistant principal um, for several months now. And he has really stepped up into that role informally and has really helped out. Um, Principal McMahon, Assistant Principal Smith, and Athletic Director Dawson in multiple, excuse me, in multiple ways. So thank you, Mr. DeMar. Um, and again, we'll have the opportunity to meet him hopefully in person come the fall. Um, but that's it for me. Uh, and I, I love other things to add throughout the meeting, but for my report, that's it. Unless you have questions for me. Not seeing any, so thank you, Superintendent. Um, no. Old business, on to new business. We have um, first up recycling at the high school and uh, Principal McMahon and a uh, handful of students, I believe we have, are gonna give us a brief presentation. Greg, I'm here and I'm having some, uh, some video issues as we speak, but I can hear and see just fine. And I know that I just, I met with my students prior to the meeting. So I do believe at least three or four of them are here. Excellent. But I'll, I'll let them do the talking and uh, here to support them, but I know they're ready to rock. Excellent. Great. Well, we'll, uh, we'll turn it over to them and uh, maybe you need to Tim. turn some lights on, Tim. It's a little dark over there. I'm sorry. Hey, Tim, I just need to know. Um, I'm sorry. I can't access their names. Is, can you just rattle the, off their names so I can admit them? Uh, Mallory Merrill, Darius Daniels. Megan Boucher, Grace Nickerson. Okay. And there's somebody else. Who am I forgetting, guys? Chime in. Um, I don't think there's anyone else. Yeah, Morehouse. Hannah Morehouse. Yeah, Hannah Morehouse. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I don't. I didn't see. Unless she joined, I did not see her in the attendees. Craig, I'll, I'll go back in the dark now. I apologize for the video oh. stuff. <laughs> no worries. All right, welcome uh, 
Mallory, Darius, Grace, and I thought there was one more I'm missing. I apologize. Um, so just some quick background. Um, this group of young students came to me uh, probably a few, few weeks ago as part of the Civic Action Project that we're working on this year uh, in US2, which is the year we kind of decided we're going to at least tackle the Civic Action Project for now. Uh, this group of students is from the APUS class, Mr. Sullivan's class. They initially met with me informally to discuss recycling at the high school uh, and then took me a step further and came up with a very nice detailed uh, presentation about their expectations and goals and uh, hopeful outcomes they, they want to speak to you guys about this evening. Uh, I don't think they expected the process to go this quickly. Uh, they brought stuff to my attention. Uh, I shared it with Craig and others and here we are this evening having to do a presentation. Uh, they have made some corrections in the slide deck that you received last week in your packets. They've made some amendments to that since uh, since last week. Uh, just some updates and some, um, I think some clarifications, but uh, generally speaking, this is a, uh, a pretty cool initiative uh, that is entirely student driven and really, in my opinion, kind of down in the spirit of what the Civic Action Project should look like. So uh, again, we're still in the infancy stages of this process in, in general, but uh, if this group is indicative of what we have to come, it's both uh, refreshing and challenging because they're going to put us on our heels a bit at times, but that's the main goal uh, is to see action through their um, civic responsibility. And I think they're doing that uh, in, a, in, a, in a very impressive way early on. So uh, that said, I will be quiet and I don't know, Grace, are you going to take lead on this? All right, I'll be quiet. Then. Go ahead. Um, hi, I'm Grace Nickerson. I'm with Mallory Morrill and Darius Daniels, and we'll be speaking on behalf of our civic actions group tonight. Um, we've created a presentation. I have it shared with Miss Ibe, but um, I should be able to present it myself. I have it. Grace, is it letting you share or do you need me to share it? No, I think if you could share, that'd be okay. Yep. great, thank you. Craig, you might not be sharing the latest version if you're doing it from the packet. Oh, that's true. Um, I can share the updated one with you. Yeah, if you could, I'm trying to figure out why you can't share though. Oh, here we go, now you should be able to share. Are you seeing the share option now at the bottom or no? Um, sorry. Right, no, there, okay. should, there should be a highlighted share screen button. Oh, yeah. I'm seeing it now. Okay. I just turned it on for, so it wasn't there before, don't worry. There you go. Perfect. Okay. Can you all see that? Yes. Yes. Okay. So for our project, we chose to target recycling at North Middlesex. Um, we are interested in change because due to the benefits of our education, we hope to promote a healthy learning environment and set an example of environmental sustainability. Starting to educate our students at NM on how to be environmentally friendly will create a sustainable habit that can ultimately protect our planet in the future, which is our larger end goal. We hope to promote a healthy learning environment because we have struggled with waste management and littering on our campus in the past. So we hope to combat these issues with our presentation. And we also would like to set an example of environmental sustainability to spark further change among the state level and other schools in the district, potentially. We are targeting recycling, reduction, and education. For, for recycling, we'll be advocating for a more efficient recycling program for paper and mainly plastic products at NM. 
reduction, we hope to advocate to reduce our ecological footprint by reducing paper and plastic waste at NM. And we want to educate the students and staff on the beneficial ways that we can reduce this footprint. Some pros and cons that we've come into along the way. Um, pros consist of will obviously reduce the footprint and the amount of solid waste produced by NM. And it will become more cost efficient as the system improves over time. Some cons are it will require students to take time out of their day just to make sure items are recycled correctly and clean thoroughly in order to be effectively recycled. And it will add more cost into our yearly budget for waste management. Okay, I'm going to pass it over to Darius now. Thank you. Um, so we think that we should care about this issue because we researched some statistics and found that the average US student uh, produces 640 pounds of waste per year, which compounded over 12, 13 years of schooling has a huge impact like on our climate. And just in Massachusetts alone, we produce 8 million tons of, uh, of waste per year. And we wanna start decreasing our ecological footprint. And that could be at schools considering that they are a large contributor of this new waste. Can you go to the next slide, please, Grace? All right, and so we uh, we took some claims from the uh, policy that was made at the high school in 2020, and it states that all district personnel are expected to uh, support recycling efforts throughout the schools, and a system to document recycling amounts will be created and implemented. And teachers are encouraged to include educational lessons on recycling in the curriculum where appropriate. And uh, as students, we've observed in our three years that these like have been loosely upheld, uh, considering we provide recycling services for paper and cardboard, because uh, we work with Harvey services, but it does not utilize the company for plastic removal. And we feel that now that COVID is taking a downturn that we can sort of focus more back to creating a greener environment, whereas we're not funneling money into keeping our schools safe from the virus and stuff. Can we go to the next slide? And so some things that like we've seen just in our school is that we have recycling bins that are flipped over to prevent use at lunches, like sitting outside in uh, by the garden. The past two weeks that we've been outside, the recycling bin has been flipped over and we've not been able to use it. So for those who feel like they want to recycle, don't have the opportunity to recycle plastic. And we only dispose of paper and cardboard products, but we do have recyclable plastics. We just don't have the means to recycle them currently. So Mallory, would you like to take it from here? Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, through this process, we hope that NM continues to use recyclable utensils and containers. In addition, we want to spread awareness of the importance of recycling. And finally, we want to implement recycling on our school grounds. Okay, guys. Um, here's, so our project is heavily run on students and we hope that students will continue this throughout the years. Um, we we'll help to assist our facility team to take some work off of them because I know it's in addition to their already work and we just want to help out as much as we can. Finally, um, students want to recycle at our school. However, it's not always available to them. And this is what we're trying to create so they can um, recycle. And finally, here's our plan of action. So we hope to get one two yard dumpster, which could be placed where all the other dumpsters are. In addition, um, in our cafeteria, we have six trash bins and we hope that gaining four recycling bins will help the needs for our recycling and that would only be $50 roughly. So our whole plan in general is under $500, which is kind of doable. And we really hope that you would consider this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. That was that was fantastic. Um, and I, 
really appreciate you holding us accountable to our own policies. So I was very pleased to, uh, <laughs> to see that in there. Um, does anybody from the committee have any questions or comments um, before I get to mine? Uh, June? Um, I just wanted to say really nice job, you guys, um, putting your information together. And I am completely in support of this. It's something that has been kind of mentioned before that it is in our policy, but it doesn't seem like it's um, acted upon as much as it should be. So, um, and this is how you start to change the world. It's, it's little steps like this, a little bit at a time. And if we can start this at the high school, we can expand it to the other schools and then go from there. So I absolutely am in support of this and I think you guys did a great job. Thanks, June. Susan? Why don't you let me go last? I'm always talking. Sure. Randy? Uh, first off, uh, one, being the policy subcommittee chair, thank you very much for reading our policies. Not everybody does, um, especially as students. I really commend you to take a look at what we're supposed to have in place uh, before suggesting what we uh, should be doing. Um, I think it's a great, um, a great initiative that you're trying to start here. Um, my question is, you had mentioned in one of the slides that um, to take, you know, that's an extra burden on the facility uh, management and that uh, there are things that can be done by the students. What, what kind of things were you thinking about uh, implementing on the student side of things? Um, well, next year we're, we'll be reintroducing FlexBlock into the high school. So our group that worked on the Civic Actions Program we plan to start, try to restart um, an environmental club. Darius can speak about that after me. He knows more about it. Um, and we will help with whatever tasks need to be done with the recycling bins, whether it's emptying them. We've already started. Um, we've created many infographics and posters, which we've put around the school just to kind of educate the students so people know what to expect and how to treat the recycling bins. That all sounds great. I look forward to seeing what can be done at the high school and then uh, rolling it out maybe to the other schools as well. Thank you, Randy. Uh, Susan? Yes, uh, and again, thank you for bringing this to our attention. I, I didn't realize um, that there wasn't um, a very active recycling program um, at the high school. And, um, and, and like, uh, like was previously mentioned, Thank you for pointing out that you're not seeing the policy that we have uh, translate into real life. The, um, I thought it was interesting that there's a system to document recycling amounts. Um, so I'll be uh, interested to see how that's implemented um, by the, uh, the district leadership um, and the, uh, the people that are assigned to by the district leadership to uh, I'm stumbling all over that, but you guys know where I'm going. And uh, Lisa, I would like to ask if we could put this um, amount requested uh, on the next uh, on the agenda for the next finance subcommittee meeting. Um, sure. And I have a question be beyond the 500. Would we be incurring um, other costs to just to, to empty those barrels by our waste management company and take them away? We're not to necessarily empty them, but to take them away and process them. We, uh, we did some research into waste management. And so Harvey Services currently has the uh, paper and cardboard products that we are recycling. And we compact that and send it off to them. But waste management does offer, uh, offer a plastic recycling service that is already incurred in the school budget. We just haven't used the plastic recycling yet we've only ever recycled paper and cardboard thus far so what we, we our contract with waste management um includes the opportunity uh to recycle plastic um so doing this plastic recycling um doesn't cost any extra from a removal from the premises that's what it had said when we had looked up our building grounds uh through the waste management website so okay yeah yeah, so it's um, 
So it's really just the 500 as an incurred cost. And that's a one time um, from the research you guys have done, you're not seeing any recurring costs uh, each year from a contractual standpoint to remove um, the products. It's um, already seems to be built into the cost and um, I'm sure we'll double check that. So um, I, I just had a curious question. Does every classroom in the high school have some sort of recycling, at least for paper or cardboard? Yeah, every classroom has a bin only for paper okay. and those are used. This is our the goal of our project was for plastics in the cafeteria mainly. Okay, okay. And I was curious, you noted in there that um, one of the cons is having the students like clean them thoroughly. Is there a, a place? Do you see that being feasible or does something have to be done to make that more feasible? Um, well, we were just, um, that was mainly to touch on like drinks need to be emptied out before they're recycled, which can easily be done in sinks or like water fountains. And any containers that have food in them just need to be dumped into the trash before the actual container is recycled, okay. which I think is easy enough to implement. Okay, so they're not sitting there with a sponge and dish soap and scrubbing things. And okay, that's what the picture I had in my head. Okay, yeah, that's all that needs to be done. I understand that. And um Oh, I also had a curious question. Um, and maybe this isn't something that you guys would have the answer to, but you mentioned the like, utensils and containers from the cafeteria being recyclable. Um, you know, some places you go, they hand out metal forks and they run them through a dishwasher. I don't know the environmental impact of the dishwasher and the metal forks versus plastic. And I, there might be reasons we don't use metal forks, but um, just to toss that out. I mean, people talk about how much water it takes to recycle things, but it also takes water to dishwash things. So I don't know. Yeah, so one of the main things that brought, was brought to our attention is that it wasn't like the plastic forks in general, it's that they were individually wrapped with plastic too, in addition to it. Okay. Didn't know that either. Um, I'm looking where, real quick here to see if I had I made notes from the prior slide conversation, but I think I've asked them all. Thank you. No, your um, your uh, slides they were enlightening, and I appreciate it. And um, thank you. And I, I wish you luck in making sure this gets followed through. And we have a part in that. Um, you're asking for us to look at funding, so I appreciate you. Um, coming to ask us and not just saying, well, I hope someone pays attention. You guys took action. I appreciate that. Thank you, Susan. Uh, Principal McMahon. Thanks, Craig. Again, there's some <laughs> visual complications, but uh, I can hear and see just fine. But uh, now, as far as the, uh, the costs go, uh, and I think Nancy Haynes probably speak that a little better than I could, but I, I'm not entirely certain that there wouldn't be an additional uh, annual cost. Um, that could be more of an Oscar Hills question, perhaps, but I know that our students looked at that carefully and based that conclusion off everything they had available to them. Uh, and that included asking me uh, and me not knowing the exact answer as well. So um, I, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I certainly want to defend them in the event that there is more expenditures uh, that are not upfront. Um, you know, that's certainly something that uh, I don't think I've looked at other schools and comparable rates, what they have as far as recycling goes with regard to plastics. Um, there seems to be an annual cost, but it could be embedded in an existing contract, what Darius had said. So I think, I think we would need clarification, clarification on that piece. Um, and, you know, to speak to what Grace had mentioned as well, as far as disposal of and cleaning of, um, you know, I, again, I speak to the plastic bottle piece only, you know, um, we would need, you know, and, and the students recognize we need some sort of either uh, access to the water fountains to, to encourage students to, to, dump, to dump bottles out. So what, if that means placing bins next to water fountains, it's a possible solution for that, um, but yeah, they definitely have uh, have slow rolled and thought about those those aspects. But again, that that financial piece, I'm not entirely certain about. But I know that Darius in in the group has definitely a good pulse on it. It's it's a low figure if there's an annual fee, and it's likely embedded in an existing contract. That's all. And Mr. McMahon, when we when uh, it's on the when the finance subcommittee can look into that along with Nancy Haynes, I think that we would want to be clear about that before moving forward with the initial. Yeah, of course. Purchase. So, um, but I, um, 
because of course you guys think of that and i believe the the place where you guys dump solids that are trash trash you know the half uneaten sandwich i would think that the um the half bottle of gatorade that didn't get drank could also just be dumped in there it doesn't have to go to a water fountain or a sink i don't think but i don't know that just tossing that as a suggestion to look into So I, I would, um, <clears throat> I think it'd be good if we could clarify just the, the cost, the financial aspect. And then, um, I mean, I personally would like to see this as a pilot program in the fall, um, if possible, and, and get this get this moving and, and, and maybe do it for the first half of the year and, and have uh, uh, students come back and, and kind of report back on how things have gone and, and have students been receptive to it. and and maybe recommend recommendations on next steps, whether it's, hey, this didn't work and we've got to regroup or it's worked so well, we want to expand to having bins in the hallway for water bottles as, as people are going to and from class or other schools or what have you. So um, if we could get the finance subcommittee to just confirm the details of the contract and, and, and what the actual cost would be and, and if there's if the money's there for it already. Um, again, I, I'd like to see it kind of start right in the fall and, and let's let's not hesitate on this one it seems like a quick win We've got passionate students willing to to put some work into it um it's, it's a perfect story in my book any you're muted susan unless you're talking to your cat yeah no i'm muted but you know it's probably for the best for our y'all but uh, and we can go through all that in the uh, finance <clears throat> committee. And um, Nancy, we could even see if there's funding left uh, for the school year's budget, uh, at least for the upfront. Uh, we can talk about that further in finance subcommittee. Yep. Um, I don't know if we necessarily need a motion here because it's I think it's really just finance related and then it's more day to day. Um, my only question or concern, knowing that there's uh, two and a half days left in the school year and, and then fall will be here before you know it, I just wanna make sure that if, if there is money available and um, it is something that the team is interested in, in doing a pilot in the fall, um, what is your sense on being able to actually do that come fall knowing that uh, not a lot of school time between now and then? And I don't know, Principal McMahon, if there's support you and your team could offer to keep things moving throughout the summer or if students could be involved somehow. Um, yeah, I think I think this has legs to go through all the summer, Craig, as far as logistics. You know, I think to your point, once we figure out the financial piece of it, uh, rolling it up in the fall would be ideal timing. Um, you know, we would, I was talking earlier to Sister Principal Smith about our class meetings we have in the fall utilizing flex block the first week of school and as part of that welcome back meeting just discussing recycling in the commons uh it really wouldn't be a major change in any sort of um policy protocols we have it's not mandatory but certainly i think to what our students are presenting tonight every step in the right direction would be a positive one so uh we could certainly get behind piloting in the fall uh gathering data you know the first semester come back to you guys in january see where we're at um, and, you know, it wouldn't be a heavy lift in our part uh, to get, help them get started. I think, the, you know, the logistical piece of where do the bins go and how do we, you know, ensure that we're not seeing uh, a lot of other waste in those receptacles. I did mention to the group that um, they might need to be monitors uh, for the, a while at lunch and get some of their friends and build a team that's able to be available at all three lunches and kind of facilitate that. Uh, but based on our meetings thus far, I feel like that they're up for that challenge and We'll support every way we can in, in that capacity, but uh, I don't expect it to be simple, but I certainly think that we can make some headway. And I think this group is motivated, motivated enough to set the precedent as, you know, rising seniors to set a model for their underclassmen. So yeah, I can get behind that all day. Great, I appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna go to Louisa next. Yes, I'll work with them to make sure that we can get this done. We'll find the money and we'll work on it and make sure that it gets implemented this fall. All right. Sounds good. I appreciate that, Lisa. Um, Susan, do you have a quick final word? Well, um, I was, and nobody second this if this sounds silly. I was going to make a motion 
to add, add this to the agenda for the next finance subcommittee meeting to um, review the uh, annual costs and to, um, I'm trying to find the right word. Uh, a total cost of ownership is probably. Yes, right. that's a great way to say it. It's, uh, to assess the total cost of ownership. Thank you. Yeah. So that's my that's motion, just to put it on the finance subcommittee meeting agenda. Yep. Have a second on that. Total cost of ownership. I'll second. All right. So the motion is to basically refer this to the finance subcommittee. Um, any other comments on that motion? All right, Dave. Yep. Jess. Absolutely. June. Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I will vote yes with many thanks uh, to Mallory, uh, Darius, and uh, Grace. I really appreciate you stepping up, uh, coming in front of the committee, putting your ideas forward, and uh, and seeing it through. So expect to see uh, some more great things from you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. And you're free to stay if you want to listen to more of this exciting meeting. So <laughs> you're also free to drop if you've got other stuff to do. They have finals tomorrow, Craig. Let them go, please. Oh, okay, yes. fine. Thank you can you. go. You can go. Go study. Good luck tomorrow. <clears throat> Good luck. Yeah, come back for the summer meetings. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Um, next up, uh, school committee goals update. Um, I think Randy and Lisa were the two kind of spearheading our goals. So kind of want to get an update on where we're at coming up on the end of the year. You had one too, Craig. Don't be getting out of it. <laughs> Did I? <laughs> Professional development. I was more talking about the compilation of our goals document and just going over what our goals were and the status of them. Oh, I misunderstood. Thank you. No worries. Can't tell if Lisa or Randy's trying to talk or not, or gathering thoughts or. Um, I would have to apologize. I did not get in, back in touch with Lisa um, to go over. We had met and uh, discussed this, but I don't couldn't find my notes on it, and I just never got back to Lisa. So I do apologize, Lisa. Uh, did you find the notes on when we were talking about? Uh, what the uh, goal should be. I know that we talked about doing like a summer retreat as one of our goals and doing the newsletter was another of our goals. Um, I, I do apologize everybody. I just been kind of um, very, very busy with a lot of different things and this got dropped. Yeah, I, I did nothing on my goal, so there's no need to apologize. <laughs> <laughs> So maybe we just say that we'll do better and we'll try this again. Yes, Lisa and I will get back together, find our notes, and at the next school committee meeting, we will have our update. That sounds good. Appreciate that. And I will also do better. Um, thankfully, the students weren't here to hear that, that part. <laughs> okay. um, we just model what our solution is, right? There you Everyone, go. Uh, makes mistakes. Yeah, absolutely. And we have a plan going forward. Pick yourself up and carry on. Um, all right. Next up, we have the uh, Valley Collaborative Board of Directors uh, appointment um, to uh, appoint Superintendent Morgan to the Valley Collaborative Board of Directors for the term July 1st, 2022 to June 30, 2023. So moved. Second. Is that Susan as the so moved? It was. Thank you. Any questions or comments on this one? Does uh, Superintendent accept this? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do. I don't think there are any options. I think it has to be the superintendent. All right. <laughs> Thank you. I think one of them allows a school committee member. I don't remember which one it was. Key, Keystone does. Okay. Strike that comment from the record, Susan. <laughs> <laughs> All right, seeing no questions, uh, Dave? Yep. Jess? Yes. 
Coon? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I'll vote yes, so that is unanimous. <clears throat> Next is the Keystone Educational Collaborative Board of Directors and to uh, appoint Superintendent Morgan to the Keystone Educational Collaborative Board of Directors for the term July 1, 2022 until June 30, 2023. So move. Second. All right. Lisa and Jess, any questions, comments on this one? All right, Dave? Yes. Jess? Yes. Whom? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I'll vote yes, so that is also unanimous. Next, we have the Keystone Educational Collaborative Lease. And this is to have the committee vote to authorize the district enter into a three-year lease agreement with the Keystone Educational Collaborative Center beginning FY 2023. FY 2023 would be the first year of the lease and the lease has two optional one-year extensions. I don't know, super, well, we'll do a second and then uh, we'll talk about it. Or so moved, sorry. So moved. Second. Second. Oh, you beat me. Right. Uh, Superintendent, do you have any uh, background on this one? Um, sure. And I don't know if um, if Ms. Haynes wants to add as well, because she's been dealing with um, with Attorney Foskett on this lease. Uh, but it, it essentially allows us to um, uh, annually. So it, it's it's an annual lease where uh, that could be extended up three years. Unless I'm misspeaking, Nancy, please let me know. Um, that we basically have to let the Keystone Collaborative know uh, by August 15th, if um, so, a year in advance. So I would have to let them know this August, August 15th, if they would not be in the property FY24. So it's giving them a one year notice in advance, um, provided that we do that. Um, we could uh, we could get out of the lease if we had to, if we absolutely needed the property for a reason. That being said, I do know that Keystone is looking at other options. They are only utilizing the elementary school next year, and they will not be utilizing the second floor. It's Guanacook. I do think they are trying to get a location that is closer to the majority of their students in the Lemonster area. Um, that's what they've done with the middle school. And I think they're actually hoping to do the same. Uh, even though Squanacook is a great property for them, um, for many students, it's a long ride for them to get to Squanacook and they are trying to get something a little bit closer. So again, um, we would be annually letting them know August 15th, if they can utilize the property, not that coming school year, but the, year, the subsequent school year. So it's, it, it's certainly um, a good amount of notice to let them know. So it's like a 12 month notice basically. Yes. And they're, they're reducing their footprint abroad. They're going from, they're on first and second floor right now. And they're going down just to the first, is that correct? Yes, the, the middle school program, which is smaller is being moved to Lemonster. Okay. So it will just be elementary school next year um, on the first floor. All right, any questions from anybody else? I just have a quick question. Um, in um, just out of curiosity, do we also provide the furnishings in all those rooms and or did they bring on their own tables and chairs and stuff? It's their tables and chairs. Oh, okay, thank you. And, um, I mean, they, they, they may be using some of our furniture, but the majority of the furniture is furniture that they brought in. Okay. I was just curious about that. And then I was curious about um, their ability to make uh, improve. They're making improvements in the area, but I was glad to see in the lease that um, any major renovations they need to get approval from the school committee to do so they yes. don't substantially alter the place. Yes. I mean, overall, they've been very easy to work with. Um, it's been a good space for them. The staff has been um, has been very easy to work with. 
the executive director and board has been easy to work with. So, so overall, it's it's definitely a, it's a win-win for the district and a and a win for for Keystone as well and the students. They have nice big classrooms that are uh, you know that that are you know that are in really nice shape for them. So that's a, certainly a benefit for those students. Thank you. Are there any um, changes to the building? Right? Any anything required that we need to do as they vacate the second floor? Is there any? I don't know if there's any partitioning that was done or anything like that, or is it they just move out of the rooms and they're all set? Um, it, on the second floor, th there was nothing done to my knowledge. Nancy, are you aware of anything? I know that they they did um, do some some minor construction. Um, on, on the lower level, but nothing's permanent. It's all, um, it, it's basically um, movable partitions to create office space. That's my understanding. And, and they'll be accountable for returning it to previous conditions, is that? Yes, perfect? yes. All right, any other questions or comments from anybody? All right, Dave. Yes. Jeff? Yes. Jim? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Sorry, first day on Zoom. Yes. Thank you. And I vote yes, so that is unanimous. Next, Craig, we have the... Uh, Craig, I'm sorry. Do you have yep. June, June moved and Susan seconded? Uh, I have June and Lisa. Lisa, okay, thanks. Yep, no worries. Um, next, we have the food service breakfast pricing for FY 22 to 23. I don't know who is going to speak. Greg, to I can probably take this one. Please, that'd be great. So we have um, the option to renew our food service contract um, for another year with Fresh Picks. Um, last year was their first year. They're proposing a break even program for next year um, with the exception of a, a, a 10 cent increase for the breakfast program. And right now we're currently at $1.50 for breakfast and their uh, proposal for next year would be at $1.60 for breakfast. Um, just as an aside, we still yet don't know for sure whether we're gonna there's gonna be a continuation of the USDA free lunch. Right now it looks like it's a no, but um, there are still some things pending, so still could happen, but right now we have to plan as if it's going to be going back to the regular national school lunch program um, to, uh, for next year. So I'm hoping um, with the break-even program that the slight increase in the breakfast, um, it's not a, not a change in the lunch prices, although looks like we might be needing to do that in a future year. Um, I don't think this is a year to do it. Um, keeping it a minor change like that is, I think, um, going to be good for families and good for the program. Just for my own clarity, so this, we're just approving the breakfast price change, correct? Is the Correct. Okay. Student breakfast. Student breakfast. Yes. yes. Adult breakfast is not. Yeah, adult, the adult numbers are not changing. I mean, they're so, they're so small anyway, generally, but. And then from a, you'd mentioned Nancy, the contract renewal, is that coming up at a future discussion or where does that sit, I guess? We have a contract with them already, um, a five year, it's actually a one year contract with four optional one year renewals. And typically the superintendents approved the renewal um, in the future years, as long as it's within that five year total that the committee approved. Okay. Thank I mean, you. I think it's I think it's gone well this year. It's been obviously a challenging year with um, nobody expected us to be doing the volume we are doing. Um, but of course, we didn't expect the free lunch program to extend this quite this long. Um, in general, it's been good for the program. We get higher reimbursements this year than we would typically get for for lunch lunches that are served. So that's really helped um, solidify the program. I think at least for this year and, and potentially if there's some funding. 
in a future article, we're going to talk about the capital plan um, to do any updates that might need to be done. We may have some funds to do that, um, which is it, which is a good thing. It's fantastic. So. Right. And um, I, sorry, I, I did reach out to both Lisa and Zune, um, who were on the. I forget the name of the committee. I'm sorry. It's the, the Food Service Review Committee. Um, and we had a short discussion and that, uh, you know, what we emailed and they both were in favor of, of continuing another year. It'd be, it'd be good. I think it, and it could just be like an informational item out to the committee, but to, to see what, if there were any high running issues that, that have come up that, that Fresh Picks has been asked to address or just kind of a status report of how they've performed over this, this last year. Cause I know they're kind of a new vendor for us. Um, Susan? Let Randy go first. All right, Randy. I uh, just had a quick question as far as the history of the prices for the breakfast, because my memory serves uh, is we haven't always raised the breakfast when we've raised uh, the lunch in the past. And the, we also really haven't had much of a breakfast uh, in, you know, if you go back a few more years, there wasn't much of a program there. Uh, what, how, how often have we raised uh, the prices of breakfast? I think we very rarely have raised them. Um, we raised them last year before it was um, going to be USDA free lunches to $1.50. And I think before that it was like $1.30 and it had been that for many years. I can, I can get the history. I'm not sure how long, but quite, quite a long time. And again, I, I, think, I think we've been, it's been underserved as far as the number of breakfasts that have been sold. And fresh, one of the uh, areas that Fresh Pick at was the breakfast area as being um, an area where they thought they could increase participation. Okay, that, that was good enough for me, just kind of sure. knowing that there were quite a number of years that we had not raised it. Thanks, Randy. Susan? I mean, just a similar question. I was just curious what was driving the lunch going up. So it looks like we, I mean, breakfast going up. It looks like, um, according to the chart here, we changed lunch prices four years ago, but we changed breakfast last year. So my assumption in looking at those numbers was they felt breakfast was way too low and they were going to raise it a little bit each year, not to be such a big. But that was a story I made up in my head after looking at the numbers. I didn't know if that had been, or something, some other story had been told to you, Nancy. I mean, that sounds about right. I, I think they looked at our pricing and they looked at how much it costs to, to produce um, a breakfast meal for students. And they, and I think it, in fairness to them, I think they really did some upgrades in that area. So right. providing a, a little bit more of a substantial meal. Um, right. And that again, dictated the increase in the pricing. Yeah, and it, it seems reasonable to me that it is a low price and um, if we need to raise it, it would be nice to raise it in an incremental fashion. Um, so, I mean, I guess the, the motion is to um, raise the student breakfast prices from $1.50 to $1.60. second. Hey, second. Thank you, Tom. Can you ask questions yeah. or comments on the price change? And I'm hoping with the free meals being served for that time period that maybe someone who hadn't participated in the past started participating and uh, found it convenient, found the food better than they thought it was going to be. And um, we may. So um, I think it would be great to start the day off with a good breakfast. All right. So the motion is to increase breakfast pricing from $1.50 to $1.60, Dave. Dave, are you still there? All right, Jess? Yes. June? Yes. Yeah. Lisa? Yes. Yeah. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I will vote yes. So that is 
unanimous, I guess we'll have Dave as an extension. Uh, next, we have the strategic plan update, Assistant Superintendent Milligan and the principals. Thank you. I'm going to start and then turn my camera back off. It's a little bit choppy on my end, so I'm just going to try to maintain bandwidth. Um, so uh, we're going to provide an overview from our mid-year report to our end of year report. I know at the mid-year, uh, it was asked of us to go through all of the action items. So we're gonna do that quickly with all of our principals and our leads for each of the initiatives. So I'm going to start with initiative one, the consistent and rigorous curriculum. Um, looking at overall the entire plan, something that we do each year is we look at the completion rate. Um, our completion rate or our in progress rate is running around 71% of this plan with 30, about 36% complete and about 35% uh, moving in, in progress. Um, and then our next steps are steps that are continuations that we'll be bring forward and that's about 29% of our plan. So initiative one really focused on the, the uh, ELA rollout and the math curriculum pilot along with common assessments. Uh, our major focus area is tying the other content revising their assessments. Um, what we found in this strategy 1-1 is that further exploration around internal capacity and external providers to collect the common assessment data is needed. Uh, we're looking at IXL as a platform that's going to be looking systematically at ELA and mathematics K-12 next year, along with a pilot for science and uh, history social studies. Um, or we're going to be looking at other companies such as EdSight or Otis that will be able to collect all of the teacher information within our district and help create a, a data platform that's going to help us really create outcomes that we can come back to to see how our students are doing in relation to all of those areas. Um, for the uh, initiative 1.2, the math pilot rollout, the district has um, formed a committee this year. They looked at three distinct programs and that they we are going to be implementing um, illustrative math at the K-8 level next year. Um, and that's going to tie back into our, our learning management system of LearnZillion, which was taken over this year. Uh, but both of our ELA and our math programs will be on one platform for the teachers. Um, and then our strategy 1.3 really focused on the first year implementation of our new K-8 ELA curriculum, uh, Expeditionary Learning or EL Education. Um, and that implementation culminated on our last PD day in May, on May 27th. Nancy? Uh-oh, uh -oh, she really got lost. Um, if you have, if we have questions, would you want to do it like one initiative at a time, get the recap of the initiative and then ask the questions? Or wait all the way till the end, what you prefer? Um. I'd rather just get through it and wait till the end if that's all right. Okay. Before Nancy comes back. So got to go around with QR code on their phone and listen to a student narrate what the task was and um, what they had to accomplish. So it was a nice culminating activity that we hope that we can bring forward in future years on that last PDA and really highlight all the good things that students are doing in the district, such as the civics action projects that you heard from our high school uh, students just recently. Um, I'm just going to ask Kevin Cormier or Lisa Camo if there's anything else that they'd like to add to initiative one consistent and rigorous curriculum. Nancy, I do have like an overarching question before we move to the next section, but I, I'll let you um, have the team speak. Sure. Kevin or Lisa, is there anything you want to add to that? I don't have any video, so I can't I can't see anybody. No, I was letting Lisa go first. I, I think you, you did a, okay. a pretty good job, but uh, if there are questions. So there's another question on section one. Okay, you know, I, I had a general question. I don't remember what the original strategic plan looked like. Which, which parts were in place the framework and what is filled in as the year goes along you know is it the the 1.1 1 
as it was what was at the beginning and then the so completed and everything added as they, go ahead so we took all of the initiatives from our plans in september and we categorized them either in a completed um, in progress or next step not started as in the middle of the year. And all we did was take every action item and categorize them where they fall at the end of the year. So you can see on the document that you provided what was actually completed. Everything let's continue go ahead okay so yeah. since we lost nancy maybe kevin or lisa could so I was trying to determine was all of the bullets under completed and in progress and next steps were they all identified at the very very beginning and you're just kind of sorting them into those three boxes depending on what the status of those were generally yes um, sometimes if we were midway uh, through one of them in progress like if part of it was completed we would break it out a little bit more finely and completed um, okay. just to kind of say you know in progress can mean like you know this whole you know, giant thing might be in the middle of it, or, you know, steps one, two, and three are done, but step four is where now we are in progress. So it, it really kind of depended from section to section as to what was able to be parsed out versus what is a, a larger uh, that, task that's being okay. done. But it was all identified at the beginning. I get the whole splitting. Yeah. Uh, it was all identified at the very beginning, and uh, it's a matter of sort. It's not... Um, and there may have been, like, I, I know when I was filling out the math one, um, something might have come up to augment one of them throughout the year and it became a completer became in progress as as I saw towards my roles like, oh this is now a thing um, okay. that I'll report on that it was done uh, but in August I might not have known okay. was a piece of it so yeah I, I know I'm famous for putting a to-do list together and if I did something extra I'd add it just so I could have something else to cross out so that's I was trying to understand the methodology here yeah. Thank you. That was my only overarching question. I had some specific questions, but um, Craig suggested we wait to the end. All right, Randy, do you have a question or? I'll wait to the end as well. Okay. Sorry. No worries. All right, Nancy, I don't know if you're back um, to go on to initiative two, I believe. In the meantime, I could ask Lisa and Kevin my more specific questions from initiative one. Sure, we can do that while we're trying to get um, Nancy back. There was an acronym CIA. Uh, I, what, what, remind me what that is. Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Okay, that makes sense. And, um, and then also there was a note about a K-12 specialist coordinator. Could you remind me what's kind of the scope of what um, that person's working on? That was on page two. Yeah, that um, that is Mike Day. So um, where the STEM will fall under me and humanities will fall under Lisa, some of the, the specialists didn't really fall into either category. So we stipended a position to oversee okay. graphic arts and and um, you know, health and wellness, uh, things like that didn't fall necessarily under our purview, but also needed some coordination along the year, but it wasn't okay. necessarily a full-time thing, so. Because I think of specialists as, you know, we're in elementary school, you go to physical education, you go to computer, you go mm -hmm. to library, but um, then middle school has a different spin on specialists, but I didn't know how specialists fit into the high school, but you answered when you said graphic design. I don't know if, um, you know, choir or band falls under specialists. Right. That also does. Yeah. Okay, so if it's anything except for reading, writing, arithmetic, <laughs> and uh, science and social studies, Correct. world language. Where does world language fall? Uh, currently, it's under specialist, but it will come into humanities in the next couple of years. Okay. Thank you for, let me see while we're waiting. Nancy's not back yet, I don't think. Yeah, Nancy's back. Oh, she is. I'll be quiet and wait. All right. <laughs> 
Answer, you good or I don't, can't tell if your video is working or not. I'm thinking no. I, I think that we're on initiative two anyway. Um, Kate Kajeka and I can start and go over 2.1, which is meeting the needs of all students. Is that okay to move yeah. on to that? Okay. That does, that sounds good. All right. So, you know, there, there were quite a few accomplishments this year with regard to initiative number two. So specifically, there were some intervention blocks from grades, grades K through eight that were established, and they were designed to gather data in both math and English language arts. The effectiveness of those inter intervention blocks was really analyzed and, and continues to be analyzed. However, based on that data, some targeted intervention can be implemented next school year for both individuals and groups of students. With regard to intervention blocks at the high school, the high school is really ready to implement a flex block next school year. And this block will run classes that were requested by both staff and students. And this is you know, an ongoing um, initiative that will continue to involve, evolve really based on the requests of those students. With regard to mental health, you know, it, it continues to be a concern and a targeted initiative area for the district. As you're aware, the district applied for a grant to support those students that are transitioning back from hospitalizations. The district did was not approved that grant. Uh, it was afforded to some higher needs districts across the state. However, I am happy to announce that the grant has been extended and the district will be applying for that grant again in the upcoming month. Uh, despite not being afforded the original grant the district applied for, our, our mental health team has really utilized um, two services, Interface and Care Solace. Based on feedback from families, feedback from the mental health team, the, the district's going to move forward with Care Solace next school year that really seemed to allow the mental health team to have some better communication with families when they were utilizing that. The mental health team also established some regular meetings with administrators, um, monthly meetings. They're gonna continue to do that next school year and, and they'll be putting those in place. Um, Kate, am I missing anything? I was, no, I, was I don't think so. I think, um, I might, yeah, I'm unmuted. Um, I don't think so. I think that's pretty much sums it up. We already um, shared previously a couple of months ago, I think in um, April, um, a presentation that you all had on the intervention program. So you were able to see a lot of the data that was collected, how the interventionists are working with the classroom teachers. And we're just finished um, our third um, diagnostic of iReady last week. Um, so we're just at the final stages of really pulling all the data together to see how the kids did at the beginning, how they did in the middle and where they are in the growth. Um, I can tell you, we had a, a brief meeting with iReady last week and our kids made so much significant progress from where they started the year to where they're ended. So we're really excited about um, really looking at the effectiveness of this intervention model this year and how we can continue it next year. So. I don't know if that would uh, leave me next for a section 2.2. Thank you, uh, Jason, so, uh, yes. I, yep, okay, great, so we'll continue on. Um, so 2.2, establishing the integrated social and emotional learning strategies um, and efforts to create a safe, positive learning environment. And so uh, this is something that we've really had to rely heavily on coming out of a pandemic as we've been trying to maintain um, connections with students. Uh, and as far as what is in progress right now, uh, currently, uh, as I'm talking with other principals uh, in the district, um, as you can tell uh, here in the document, but just looking at possible exploratory opportunities uh, and topics that uh, all students could benefit from, uh, looking at results, um, you know, meeting to determine, uh, you know, what we could, uh, what opportun opportunities we could afford, um, and uh, basically just looking for opportunities for education uh, and student leadership. Um, for our kids K to 12. Um, uh, continuing on as far as, let's see, 
uh, the high school. Um, the, there's some time in progress right now as far as providing some PLC time uh, to create some workshops as far as things like financial literacy, uh, interview skills, uh, changing a tire, which actually I had to do a couple days ago. Um, and, uh, and you can read on, but as far as the middle school, uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, peer matches and mentor ideas. Uh, we would love to, uh, look to start creating opportunities for student leaders to be identified, uh, in particular our eighth grade. Uh, we've piloted a program where we've been, uh, matching some eighth grade student leaders, uh, and putting them in a related arts classes, those, uh, special, specialty classes, uh, that were mentioned a moment ago. Uh, to kind of help uh, provide kind of positive role models for the younger kids. Uh, in particular, we focused on grades five and six. Um, other things the middle school has done is also uh, school counselors getting into classrooms, uh, working with students uh, and supporting them there, um, and also just kind of uh, establishing and, and helping out with uh, all of our work uh, with Patriot time. Um, also, as far as uh, talking with Ann and Katie at the um, elementary level, uh, encouraging student participation in things like student council. Uh, buddy reading has started. Uh, I think Katie was telling me that it was uh, established a little bit more with uh, the third grade and preschool, perhaps. Uh, but I know that fourth grade and first grade were involved as well. Um, I don't want to misspeak on that, but I know that there was some progress there. Um, uh, and currently, as far as what we're doing for next steps, uh, is we do want to proceed with some kind of mentoring program. We're identifying uh, and, and looking to focus on that transition from elementary into middle uh, and how we're able to uh, partner some uh, fifth grade students with a, uh, a peer leader in the eighth grade uh, and what that would look like uh, not only during the summer but over the course of a school year. We still have some uh, some road to cover there, uh, but we are looking at, we've already met as a faculty to talk about core values, uh, which we would um, focus on you know, our school core values when uh, looking to you know, partner with kids and, and develop those leadership opportunities. Um, and then lastly, as far as another bulleted item, as you can see, you know, teachers are building meeting uh, to work on building an action plan regarding secondary staff, uh, making some high quality uh, social connections with students, um, checking in with them. That's where you start talking about a student advisory, uh, which we are uh, gonna be looking to do at the middle level as well. Um, and so we, we have a ways to go, but I think this year there's been a lot of good work done uh, to establish you know, some ideas look at what resources we already have uh, and how we can um, uh, enhance them. Thank you. So next up would be strategy 2.3 and that would be Anne from Well Gap. Good evening. So Lori Smith from the high school and I worked on this. Um, 2.3. And so the first part of it, it's broken into two parts. And the first part was um, offering um, parent workshops and guardian workshops, information nights. And our goal was to offer at least of three, a minimum of three. And we offered a total of seven this year, which was wonderful. I know I attended one, some, all of us attended one or more. Um, and the one I attended was on uh, managing how to create safe and welcoming schools for all students. That was by Jeff Peretti. And I can tell you on that call, it was the day before um, a holiday um, that we had off in the month of November. And we had at least 25 people on the call. Um, we had students, we had staff, we had parents, and it, it was wonderful to see. Um, so we have them all listed out. Um, so as I said, anywhere from 20 to 30 people attended. Um, we are looking to get a survey out to parents to see if those were helpful, if they wanna do them again. Um, I know I talked to Brad Brooks, um, director of special education and we videotaped them um, so that if parents weren't able to come that they are able to still listen to those. And we're just gonna get a feel for what's coming next, what parents are looking for. And then over the summer, our team will look at getting those people on board to present those topics next year. I think they were helpful for parents and parents could opt in or out of any one of those depending on the school age of their children at home. Um, the second bullet um, was, to prevent, uh, was to provide ongoing access and update our mental health, um, which is underneath the blue tab on our school website. Um, so there's a special tab there. There's two bullets under there. 
Um, and it talks about, there's, there's lots of things. How do we help students? How parents can help students? Um, it also talks about the care um, solace that um, Margaret was talking about. So lots of information if parents want to um, log on to that. I know we also, any information that's coming out to us, we try to put it on all our Facebook pages and weekly newsletters so that parents have access to those. Um, so our next steps as a group is to find um, things that parents are interested in and we'll work on this summer to locate um, presenters for that. Thank you. Hey everybody, I had 3.1. Um, wait a minute, wait a minute. Evan, there's one more. Yeah. <laughs> what about 2.4? Sorry, forgot about 2.4, let's go. <laughs> okay, um, so 2.4 is that um, NMRSD will guarantee that race practices are eradicated and diversity, equity, and inclusion are embedded in practice for our students, faculty, and staff. Um, some of this has already been completed. You can see um, the high school had already completed their trainings and the middle school and ele elementary school, um, they're scheduled um, with Firefly um, and um, so those things are, um, are coming. I, I know that the elementary school teachers are very much looking forward to those, those trainings. Um, so we have some things that are in progress. Um, I can't see this, let's see. Um, you know, obviously all of our schools do strive to have a welcoming community for all students. Um, we are still looking for, looking at determining what, what are the best resources for students. Um, Training for district staff is, is already scheduled. Um, you know, we're gonna be looking at policies um, and you know, they've determined that we're gonna look at, I think three policies um, to make sure that they are um, inclusive for all students. Um, Brad, uh, did you wanna chime in here? Brad and I are on this one. No. Brad Morgan or Brad Brooks? Brad Morgan. No, I can keep <laughs> going. You know, I can talk all night. So, no. Okay. Um, so, you know, like it says, we're going to choose three policies to examine, get feedback from students um, around those policies, um, and incorporating diverse perspectives into the curriculum. We're going to be doing an, um, an audit of our English language arts curriculum. So that will give us some, some signs. And there are, there are some basic things around that, that that you know we will be looking at in terms of um, you know, what students are exposed to uh, in the classroom. The, the EL curriculum, I have to say, does have a lot more um, diverse you know, readings for, for students. So that is already kind of in place. Um, and I didn't know if Kevin wanted to weigh in on this too, Kevin Cormier. Um, because he's heavily involved in the in the committee. Sorry, Tara, I just got sound back. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, you know, this is this is a topic certainly that we are all, um, you know, very invested in, and um, that the district is invested in. Um, so, you know, for all of our students, I guess we'll take questions at the end. So. Uh, Evan. Are you done, Tara? <laughs> All right, thanks. Sorry for jumping ahead of you there. Um, so I did uh, 3.1, which is jumping into our culture and community part of the strategic plan. Uh, the outcomes that we were hoping to achieve were to improve communication with the community and beyond, uh, and to increase awareness of school and district activities through the use of social media and news outlets. We, we, we've always had a smattering of schools that use uh, social media, but we really wanted to make sure that we standardize that through uh, the entire district. So we did establish social media accounts for every school. Uh, schools primarily do use Facebook, uh, but Instagram and Twitter is used as well. And those are great resources for seeing what, what is happening in the, in the schools. Um, we did other things too. We did start working on a where, is, where are they now alumni spotlight. Uh, that information has been shared with the community and we've collected that information from the community. Uh, that information can go out in newsletters. Um, 
The district also invested in um, a platform for making it, uh, newsletters a little more um, catchy and be the and with the ability of um, gathering data from them. Uh, so that platform was actually called S'more. And you might have noticed that from a lot of the school-based newsletters that uh, they kind of had that, that look and feel uh, that's a little more engaging. Um, so that was, and that can be sent directly out to parents uh, through ConnectEd, which does allow for, you know, the ability to, to receive an email or to get a text uh, when one of those emails is sent out. Um, and then we're continuing to engage um, communication and to update our mission and core values using images, um, you know, consistent imagery uh, from all of the North Middlesex schools. And like I just said, um, the stats that show engagement through this is, are pretty compelling um, because, you know, we're able to kind of see which way our parents are interacting with, with these newsletters. That's it for 3.1. And then Lauren, 3.2. Um, yeah, please. So for, yeah, for 3.2, we were focusing on culture and community. And um, Nancy spoke about this, but I think the connection was breaking up a little bit. Um, one great example of something that her curriculum team with Kevin and Lisa um, was able to do recently was the Friday before our um, vacation, we had a celebration of student work at the high school. And it really was amazing. And it was a great opportunity for staff to get together in one common location and to really celebrate the hard work of the students, celebrate the hard work of staff, um, and it was a nice culture builder as well. Um, so that, that was a really great event that um, we look forward to continuing on in the years to come. Um, another item that we had success with this year was creating a transition plan. So one goal that we have is to create a smooth transition for students as they move from preschool to kindergarten, from elementary school to middle school, and then again from middle school to high school. And part of this is to have a nice smooth transition for the students and their families, but and also to help retain these students so that they don't go looking for a, you know, a private school. We want to keep our students here in the district. Um, so we created a transition plan at the beginning of the year, and then through the year we were able to tweak it a little bit. And so in this plan, we created opportunities for students to go visit their school school that they were going to be attending the following year. Um, so students went to um, their new school and had tours. They met students, they met staff, and they learned about the programs that are going to be offered to them. And the students really enjoyed these visits. I know when the elementary school students came over to the middle school, they just, they loved it. And when the middle school students went over to the high school, they came back and they were ready for high school. I mean, it was really um, a great opportunity for them. Um, also, we uh, made sure that the schools that students were going to be going, they also came down to visit. So the high school came to middle schools and they they're with their performing arts teams and they put on shows for our students. Um, they also came down to help us during STEM week, which was really nice. Um, we were able to have the robotics and STEM um, teachers from the high school come to both middle schools for two days and do some activities with our students and share about the technology and robotics programs, um, which really helped the kids get excited about going to high school school and learning more about these programs. Um, we also had parent information sessions for all levels. Um, so the elementary, middle, and high school had great nights to provide parents with information about the transition and how to help make their child be successful in the coming year. Um, and then another addition was for staff to get together and to talk about the students and student needs so that we're better prepared for these students and making um, all their needs met when they get there. So we're going to continue. We've made a few tweaks to the plan, but we're going to continue this next year. Um, I think it was really a, a great success. Um, another part of our community building part of our plan um, was to support the care and um, of the grounds and the, um, the our buildings. So all of our schools have created a group of students that is in charge or has a, a part in keeping the grounds beautiful. And the students really take pride in this. And I think that, that that's so important in our beautiful facilities. Um, we also continue with our Adopt-a-Spot program. Currently, we have 
have 14 adopt a spots within the district where businesses or families have taken on an area that they are in charge of. So we're hoping to grow that as well in the next um, coming year. Um, we have we've created some flag banners at the school to try to um, hook on to that, you know, NM pride and to really show our pride in our buildings. So that's what I have for three two. I have the dubious honor of 3.3 uh, with Mr. Brooks as my supporting cast, but uh, I do think all kidding aside, Lauren and Evan have articulated some of the really, some of the key highlights, but some of the things that I can speak to with regard to, I think, community um, outside of the school itself and what we've done to kind of almost kind of incorporate marketing into some of these aspects of community events. Uh, for example, um, and I, I could give more precise examples if you'd like, but you know, throughout the course of the year, we, we've really tried to, what Evan talked about, using S'more as an app to, to really spread our wings a bit with regard to getting marketing out there and letting people know about the events. We've had um, some really good communication with middle school and high school with regard to not just the visits, which have been effective, but also program of studies, uh, our guidance team working with the guidance team at the middle school to help facilitate a very smooth process with regard to course selection um, heading into freshman year. Uh, in addition, you know, with regard to increasing uh, staff, faculty, and community events, uh, those of you who attended graduation uh, or were able to view it, we had over 25 of our high school staff volunteer for that event this year. Uh, in addition, several staff volunteered their efforts for Project Grad, um, as well as other events like the, uh, the very highly viewed musical we had this past spring, three basically sold out shows, and then our Cancer Awareness Day, which also took place this spring, uh, featuring combination of athletic events as well as uh, overlapping with some community events uh, going on inside the school. Um, as far as outside opportunities to work in the community, um, this year we hosted Earth Day on campus. Massive turnout. Uh, I think it caught A.D. Dawson and Mr. Uh, Oscar Hills by, uh, by uh, surprise with the amount of parking needed. Now we know, but uh, next year we'll probably minimize our parking because we're actually using across the street for that, which is a nice problem to have. Um, with regard to, the, and I'm just going through some of the bullets we highlighted. We uh, populated district counters with all events. That's been a bit of a challenge to be fully open. We're meeting tomorrow, actually. Uh, the ML schedule, albeit lovely software, is not the most friendly, accessible software. So we'll work with Jeremy Hammond on that to see if we can kind of streamline uh, a better means of getting all activities uh, visible for all viewers and all community members. Uh, in addition, Collaboration outside of the school day uh, with Pepper, Pepper Community Media uh, on several events uh, on campus, including graduation, uh, NM Cares as well. As another group we've worked with in several capacities. We'll continue to work with them uh, in years to come because we found some really good outcomes with them. Um, with regard to increasing faculty presence at community events, uh, there was a bullet mentioned in progress before uh, with regard to adding QR codes. For wide distribution. Uh, we're working with Life Touch right now, our current contract with them uh, concerning photos. We do the IDs with them every year. They have capabilities to get a barcode at the back of all student and faculty IDs. What we'd like to try to explore is if we're able to use that as a means for students and staff to get into games, meaning if a student has money on his or her account, they can use their ID simply to be swiped um, at the door or the gate of an of athletic event or a play. We're not sure in the technology yet, but we did learn last week. We hosted an MIAA event. Our girls lacrosse team hosted a game, and the MIAA has a method that they use to sell tickets online and scan at the gate. Uh, granted, with a significant markup, we would probably get rid of that part of it. But um, otherwise, we have seen an increased uh, amount of staff uh, at uh, a variety of events. Um, and this is we got this data through PLCs back in April. Um, you know, some reflection of high school staff in particular events they've been able to attend uh, and, and their desire to see more access to those events as well. So again, I don't want to uh, be redundant with what Lauren and Evan already mentioned, but certainly um, a lot going on in a good way. And, and I do think that we are finding, I think Project Grad, for example, is a really tremendous community partner, um, you know, communicating with, with that group of Tremendous volunteers on a very frequent basis, I think, only enhances what we can provide our students. So, so I think we're going in the right direction uh, with many of these aspects uh, on the 3.3 here. But again, there's still, there's still definitely some work to do. And 
I, I think we've done a lot of reflecting as a team as to what we can do better for next year, both within the district ourselves as, as leaders, but also how to get more stakeholders involved on the outside. So that kind of sums up 3.3. Mr. Brooks, anything else to add to that, my friend? No, I think you did a nice job uh, hitting all these salient points there, Mr. McMahon. Thanks. All right. Um, Ms. Cuomo, do you have a question? So I just wanted to jump on the end of what Tim had mentioned. So one of the um, things was to use um, the National Honor Society. So I worked with Laura Messina and I would say 10 to 15 students went to all three elementary schools back in the fall and all did their hours, their required hours in all three of the elementary schools. So I appreciate that work that was done. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Susan, you're muted again. Still muted, Susan. Uh, I think so. I think someone's muting me. I'm just kidding. Um, on page eight, there was a bullet related to um, growth. And I don't know how possible it is, but we do our, um, there's, a, there's a presentation that uh, Nancy Milligan gives in the fall about MCAS scores. And sometimes that includes um, AP scores, but um, if it's possible, I would love to hear about our year over year growth scores as part of that presentation. The uh, next question I had was uh, page nine in block number oh, three, it talks about there was a survey done this spring. Block two, bullet one. <laughs> so I'm just curious if you're, um, if you're starting to see the results of that survey um, to be able to provide some feedback. I don't know if that's been analyzed yet. Sorry about that, I uh, bear with me here. I'm in the <laughs> I'm in transition to attack the here, so I'm in the truck. Um, so as far as I think we're on page eight, in is it in the in progress survey of stakeholders regarding possible exploratory opportunities? Is that what you're referring to? It's you right. It is in progress wherever it went. Oh. Susan, I can speak to that. Supplementary programming opportunities to be offered. Yeah, that is April, May, 2022. Yeah, Susan, I can speak to that briefly. Uh, I know at the high school, um, we actually kind of turned it a bit and we leveraged our PLCs in the month of April to work with staff on kind of bringing their ideas to the forefront with regard to flex block for next year. Uh, and I think that's what Jason spoke of with regard to you know things like um, financial literacy, uh, resume building, okay. you know, and everything again in between. So we're still sorting through that right now. Uh, I'd be okay. happy to share that out uh, later this summer when we go through all the data. But yeah, we have uh, a good amount of feedback from all four of our PLCs of the high school that uh, we're trying to organize in a way that's somewhat like job prep versus life skill, you know, and try to categorize it. But yeah, all we right. got some great feedback from staff on that. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, and I would, I would say, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I was going to move to the next topic. I'd like to hear Jason. I was just going to concur at the middle level. I know Lauren can speak a bit uh, if she uh, would like as far as with the statistics, but uh, we also, uh, as far as how we were able to get some feedback from staff, it was more talking with our teachers than it was surveying. Um, so it was more uh, conversation than just getting feedback from them uh, that we can uh, share out. That is in progress right now. Um, so just to add to what Tim was saying. Okay. Um, sounds like Lauren, you got it covered. You didn't have any extra comments. Uh, the next comment I have was Evan. Are you talking about the social media? No TikTok? <laughs> Kidding. And one comment I had on the transition to high school. I had a kid. Now, this was nine years ago. And um, they were really enamored with the tech because they felt like the tech had all these choices. And their impression of high school was just more middle school. They didn't fully grasp our marketing at the time and our talk to the kids about what was offered. Um, 
this kid didn't understand that there was all kinds of choices in a program of study. They just thought it was just more middle school when you take these classes um, without much choice. So and the text sounded more interesting because it sounded like there was a bunch of different choices. So just You're right, Susan, and I think that that was part of our goal in having like the robotics and STEM and tech teachers come to our school and they brought robots and they brought all of the great things that they do at the high school to our students and they had them play with them and work with them and they right. got them really excited because I think the tech does look appealing when you visit and you see all the shops. So right. we tried to bring the high school shops you know, so to speak, down to the middle right. school to show them. Right. Okay, cool. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say it's nice to know that there's choices in English and social studies. But yeah, when you're working in when the texture competition, yes. Um, and then I had, uh, oh, I was curious, do we know how many adoptive spots are remaining? I think we can have as many as we want. I think there, I know there's plenty, you know, at most schools. Okay, then, um, and then I, I guess um, one of the, um, at least at Hawthorne Brook, maybe it's at Mississippi too, that we do lose, lose kids at the seventh grade to go to our charter. Um, so I don't know a strategy we could look at to uh, retain those students or whether we already start losing them in sixth grade, um, or whether there's other factors other than just programming. I don't know a lot about that. I just remember hearing that seventh grade is a typical loss. Um, uh, Susan, is, Susan, if I can speak one second to that, we actually spoke yeah. to quite a few parents at eighth grade parents of program studies night, and they reflected that they're making determinations. Again, this is a general kind of qualitative feedback, but uh, feedback that was such that they're intimating that the decision to go to the tech is happening as early as grade five and six. So that's mm -hmm. going to impact some of our, our programming next year with regard mm -hmm. to, you know, talking to Lauren and Jason about bringing our band and choral groups down there and, and featuring other things like that. STEM hitting grades five, six, seven, eight in different ways, different capacities, mm -hmm. you know. And if that means giving free tickets to a football game on a Friday night to all grade five, we want to really try to market um, really starting in grade five and six. Yeah, I think I think waiting till eight is actually putting ourselves behind the eight ball. That's right. what we've learned the past couple of years. So, yeah, I think um, seven makes more sense, but we're really trying to go five and six as well. And I think um, there's – what is the name of the school – that uh, that opens at seventh grade. Parker it, School. Yes, Parker. That's yeah. it. I think I've heard one of the reasons kids stay here <laughs> go to Parker is our music program. Yeah, I believe uh, that. And and one thing um, just to expand upon what um, Tim was just saying, when the the high school did come down to perform for us, we didn't just have the eighth grade in the audience, but we had all of the students in the audience. Um, and similarly, when um, Barnum Brook came over, we had third and fourth grade come over. So we are trying to extend it um, younger and younger. And I think this year we really did, I mean, beef it up. I mean, Tim came over, he, you know, the band, the chorus, we were over there, his, you know, athletic department came over. Um, every month there was some connection with the high school, right. which was great. Yeah, I've heard more than one time um, that parents have made the choice to stay because whoever they were thinking about going to couldn't match the excellence of our music program. That, yeah. That's why they chose to stay. Um, the, I have a, a question completely unrelated to this. So uh, I'll put my hand down and uh, be recognized at the end of the meeting. All right, Randy. Okay. I just had two questions. Um, the first one is in section 2.4. Four, um, so that is in uh, on page twelve. Um, part of the next steps was to examine policies for uh, racialized practices, uh, to examine them, and gather feedback from students uh, around these policies. I just wanted to uh, make sure that if these are not building-based policies, um, that the school committee is kind of brought back up, as well as if anything that you find. Um, requires some changes uh, to the district policies that again, the school community be brought in to look at these policies and what you found uh, so we can take a look and see if we can improve the district wide policies along with those um, other policies that you're looking at. Um, so I, just, I guess I just, you know, I wanted to make sure that uh, the policies you're looking at um, 
the question was, are they building based policies uh, and, what, and what, what's being done there or are you looking at the district wide policies? Randy, I can speak to that. This is Nancy. Um, okay. That was something that came up in one of our um, infinity groups last year is looking at things such as dress code policy, which is really not a policy per se, but things in the handbook that um, may favor one group over another. So as we started to think about everything that we implement in a district and we think about the intended outcomes and the unintended outcomes, those are some of the things that were examples of. So the word policy was used, but I don't think it was necessarily in the most formal way. It was to look at what practices across the district. And, and a better word might be procedures also. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the thing also is when you're examining those, do keep in mind um, that we have policies that really kind of work their way down. The policies are at the top end of any of the procedures that you have in place. Um, so do think upward. So if you find something um, and make sure that, you know, that if it does go upward, that we're aware of the changes that need to get made, because obviously um, we know our policies aren't perfect. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we want to keep them up to date with what the, what the district wants to do and keep, you know, any problems that we find, we want to make them uh, better for everybody. Um, and then my other question was going back to the math program that is coming in. Uh, and this may or may not be the right place for it, but I'm curious what is different about the new math program, uh, K-8, to um, that's going in. I know my daughter, gosh, it's probably 15 years ago, uh, came in and they had just started Singapore math. I know I was part of probably four or five years after that, looking at the next uh, math program that came in, which I think was the big ideas uh, that we're using now. Um, and then obviously now we're looking at a new math program. So I'm wondering uh, what is different in this math program uh, that makes it better um, than what we've had before? Is it just better aligned with the frameworks? Uh, is, are there new um, techniques uh, that have developed in the education world as far as math goes that, that this new program is incorporating? Sure, uh, actually uh, both of those things are true. So I'll, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. The, the big idea is we're barely using anymore because it is not currently aligned. We were using a 2010 version of it after the, sh the shift in frameworks in 2017. It really does not serve uh, anything that we're doing right now. So we, we've been on kind of a path to move differently uh, over the last few years anyway. Um, so over the course of the last two to three years, um, there's been some significant shifts brought forth by a lot of research from NCTM and the Association of Two-Year Colleges, the Association of Four-Year Colleges, basically saying um, the their sort of tag is that the status quo no longer works. Um, so we, um, brought in a couple of different types of programs for teachers to, to test out. We got some feedback. We, we um, looked at uh, iReady data midway through the year to see effectiveness. And Illustrative um, really just kind of graded out the best across the board. And what makes it different, it is more, uh, they call it problem-based learning. Um, so rather than just worksheet after worksheet after worksheet, which um, research is showing is not effective any longer given advances in technology, um, it really does start to um, fundamentally change the ways in which students uh, sort of grasp math as a concept rather than as a, as a process of calculation. Um, because ultimately what's being um, the, the most important thing that students are going to have to be able to do is not to find the number, but it's to make a decision based on the number or the value or, the, or whatever happens. Uh, and so this is really starting to build a lot of more uh, discourse, a lot more uh, differentiation is built directly in, uh, because if you would just attack a problem, if you have a student that is uh, seeing it one way versus a student seeing it another way that will uh, bring in some discourse and some discussion and you know give multiple ways to attack problems and multiple ways to sort of see different ways to, to do things and how situationally one uh, process might be more efficient versus another. And I've gone into uh, you know multiple classrooms over the course of the year and seen some absolutely amazing things out of students by some of the, the teachers that are piling this. I would be remiss not to highlight uh, Karen Richford over at Ashby for some of the work that she's done. It's been, it's been mind blowing to just go in there and just watch fourth graders have a level of discourse that I in teaching seventh and eighth grade for 15 years didn't see as regularly as I saw 
fourth graders do um, just halfway through the year doing this program. So I was very, very encouraged by what I saw there. And I know that we have such talented teachers in this district that it is, it is a shift, it's a mind shift. It is a, a slightly a higher degree of difficulty to implement at the beginning. Um, but again, knowing what we have to work with in this district, I am fully confident that uh, we'll be able to, um, you know, meet whatever challenge comes our way, you know, be able to work together collaboratively. Uh, we have all sorts of training and the implementation team, implementation team uh, is going to be put in place. Uh, we're going to be working very directly instead of in the past where a lot of this professional development was just sort of math content teachers. Uh, it's going to really incorporate special ed teachers in there to, to make sure that they're part of these discussions and how to reach all the students. Um, and it really, you know, when this does kind of hit the ground after a year or so, when, when we really kind of get everybody's teeth into this, I think you're gonna see uh, some, some really great progress. And ultimately it's gonna better prepare our students for what is gonna be asked of them later. And, uh, I, and so one of, the, like, one of the bullets that I had on, uh, on mine was in October, I spoke with a college uh, math department over at UMass Lowell. It kind of got an idea of, you know, who are, who, who are the students that we're producing versus what are the students that they're expecting? And that was a lot of what they were saying. It was like, they can, they can get to an answer, but then they don't know what to do with an answer. Uh, and because we just have not worked with them enough because traditional education and math is not really uh, highlighted that for students. It's been a lot more about like, answer this problem, answer this problem, but not the, and now what, and how do you know? And if I change this, how does this change your decision-making process? And this curriculum really does hit a lot of those. Um, it is, as far as Ed Reports goes, one of the highest rated uh, in the country. Curate um, also rated it very, very highly. It's the example curricula used with Achieve the Core, which is what we base a lot of our vertical um, uh, professional development on all of our alignment of standards from K to eight when we did that work a few years ago. So it really does have its roots in a lot of what we're doing already. It really is just kind of taking that next step out there and it's gonna challenge our teachers, it's gonna challenge our students, but ultimately it's gonna produce better results. Okay, I, I think that's absolutely wonderful. It does sound like it's a great path uh, to start going down because I know at least my youngest always asks me, well, what am I gonna do with this? Why am I learning this math? How do I, you know, what am I ever gonna need to use this? So I think that's a great thing if we can start teaching that. Uh, you touched upon just the, the second uh, part of my question with this is reaching out to the UMass Lowell Math Department. I think that's a great first step and I think that's a very good college. Uh, but we do have students that go to more rigorous colleges such as RPI. Um, I know we've had students go to Harvard um, in the last couple of years and some of the really more demanding. Um, have we thought about reaching out to those math departments um, yep. or any of these colleges that are much more um, math intensive uh, majors like engineering, physics, and making sure that we're not um, ignoring our high achieving students, that we're giving them what they need to make it into those really um, competitive schools. No, and, and that's certainly a, a good point. Uh, I went with UMass Lowell, one for its proximity, but two, that is um, uh, quantitatively where more students go. So I'm trying to figure out how do we hit more of our students. And, and really it's about, you know, those statistics about the uh, number of students who leave and then need to take a remedial math course, uh, end up taking a course that does not give them credit, but does give them debt and they're like one fourth is likely to graduate. So those are the sorts of numbers that, you know, we're trying to hit first, make sure we're hitting that, that broader base of, of students. The next step is, as you suggest, like go reach out to some of those um, uh, programs at schools that are specifically, you know, a STEM pipeline. And then what is that next step? I have uh, done enough sort of independent research that the results are fairly similar and it's a lot of the same things. I, I know uh, Robin uh, can attest to what her son is doing this year at Clarkson is very problem based. Like, so these kinds of um, situations where they're not just throwing, again, a textbook and do problems one through 20 and just make them harder just to challenge you. They're really about what is the use case of this? What is the context of this? Where is the collaboration come in and where? You know, how, how are you working together that if your group can't figure out what's going on here, we'll bring in another group to look at it and sort of like that peer collaboration, that, that peer thing. So all of those things are, are happening at that uh, first year of college level. And so, again, this is really kind of pointing towards that. And it's much less about get a pencil and paper and figure out how to factor uh, because they'll never be asked to do that once they leave the halls of our, our building. So, you know, what, what can we do to kind of bridge that gap and make that easier for them? And it turns, it, it basically comes down to, by de-emphasizing the, the robotic process and really emphasizing the true deeper understanding that should, I mean, there's, 
there, there's really no argument against that being helpful, no matter what that next step for any student is, because it's that deeper comprehension of math and relationships in, in, the, in the numbers and the patterns and all of the things that are going to be the application later on. Um, and so, so they, it, it can't move them backwards because the technology will take care of calculations for them. It's that analysis after the fact that we really need to start uh, hit, hitting a little bit harder. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments on the strategic plan? All right, I appreciate everybody's time to provide uh, <clears throat> to provide that update. Very detailed and, uh, and much appreciated. All right. I just, my question um, is for Lauren before you tell everybody they can go. But I want to finish this. Is it talk. related to the strategic plan? Um, no, it's related to the donations. I just missed asking it earlier. Okay. You make it quick. We got a lot of other stuff to do. So. Yes. Um, no, Lauren. In the um, in the donations, it was there was um, reference to um, a very nicely sized donation for an outdoor learning center. I was just curious what the outdoor learning center is. It sounds interesting, but. <laughs> Yes, you'll have to come see it. We will invite you in the fall for sure. Um, so something that we really wanted to do even before COVID was to create an outdoor space for students. We have a beautiful facility, but we don't have a playground. We don't have a place for students to go and enjoy outside. Um, so we wanted to create an outdoor classroom, which can be very expensive, um, but it's an area that can be used for students to sit and have lunch. They could have, be out there with their teachers and have a class. Um, they could use it you know, on graduation day to, to be out there, um, but it's actually a space behind our school and it's almost done. Um, we are very fortunate that a family in Pepperell who would like to be anonymous um, has made a nice donation to make this possible. And we're very grateful for that. So Thank it's you. part of our 20 year initiatives that will be 20 years in the fall. And so we are planning a 20 year celebration for the school and the outdoor learning space will be part of it. So we're excited to, to show that off in the fall. We still have some work to do, right, Mr. Worth? <laughs> We had um, planting going on and the community has really embraced this. We have um, many community groups working with us to accomplish it. So is it's this, been a fun project. That's cool. Is this like roughly the size of a normal classroom or just to get the size in my head? No, it's quite big. Large. <laughs> uh, like a gymnasium size, like Miss Atissant's gym? Yes. I yeah. Say, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yep. If you're, it's right in the back of the school. So if you drive around the road, you'll, you'll see it. It's under construction, but it's looking yeah. good. Nice. Thank you. And thank you to the anonymous donor. Definitely. All right. Thank you. Lisa, do you have something real quick? Yes. It's a very nice area and the kids were very motivated. My daughter came home and said she planted stuff in the back and they loved it and the kids enjoyed it. So thank you for putting your time into it. Thank you. All right, moving on, if there's nothing else on uh, that. Um, superintendent evaluation. So um, I'm still missing evaluations from a number of committee members. So we're not gonna do the formal uh, full evaluation review tonight, um, but we will do that as soon as possible. For those that have not kind of turned in your homework yet, um, if folks could get me stuff this week. Uh, I really want to get that compiled and out to the committee for review for those that did turn in their homework on time. Uh, very much appreciated. I'm starting to compile that. Um, but uh, again, missing missing a few more. So I need to get that put together. Um, and then we'll go through the consolidated comments and, uh, and, and do the actual review piece. But from the, the superintendent's contract, we do need to talk about the compensation piece that by the 15th, which is Wednesday. So we have to do that tonight. And as long as there aren't, as a collective committee, ratings below proficient, um, then uh, then the contract calls for a 2% increase. So I've not seen in the, in the uh, evaluations that I've received um, anything lower than proficient. I want to give those that maybe have already turned theirs in or have not, so not to call anybody out. Um, if there's any concerns that that the rating may swing one way or another, I'm not sure that it could average wise, but um, 
If not, then we'll, we need to proceed and just vote on the uh, uh, formalize the increase per the contract. All right, so seeing no concerns, we will proceed with the uh, understanding that the rating would be proficient or above um, for this cycle. And um, we just need a motion to um, approve based on that rating of proficient or above uh, the 2% increase per the contract, for the superintendent's contract, effective July 1, 2022. So moved. I heard Jess, but I saw Susan's lips move. So I'll give no, it to I'll, Jess and I'll give Susan the second. <laughs> I don't, I, I didn't say anything, but I'm very happy to step in a second if you need me to. Sure. All right, any questions or comments? So um, we are just voting to confirm this is proficient or above and the contract automatically kicks in based on that voting. Correct, yep. But we need to have that discussion per the by June fifteenth per the per the language in the contract that you sent me. So, and the, the feedback, I assume the feedback you've gotten so far, um, we're headed in the, the direction of of that anyway. Correct. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, I think every rating from every person so far has been proficient, unless I've missed something. But again, I'm still missing a handful. So. I'm going to give those folks a chance to say their piece and now uh, get that compiled into the into the evaluation. We'll run through those comments at the next meeting. All right. So no further questions or comments. And just for the record, Dave did drop around eight thirty. Um, so Jess. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Lisa. Yes. Yeah. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. Yes, so that is unanimous. Um, I don't know, uh, Ms. Haynes, do you need anything further than that vote um, from a financial perspective? Or I don't know who this goes to. Uh, the only issue is that after we, the subcommittee reviewed, are you talking about the transfer, right? I'm sorry. No, I'm talking about the... Uh, yeah. Salary oh, for the for the, oh, sorry, I, I moved on. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's, okay. If you could just, um, I think um, the committee's vote would be fine. Okay, perfect. Then we're good. Um, moving on to subcommittee reports. A lot of people dropped off at that. Yeah. Um, nobody wants to hear my financial stuff, huh? Yes, not, huh? <laughs> um, I don't know, Lisa, oh. anything from Accelerator Repair? <laughs> Justice. Not yet. No. No. All right. Um, building committee. We're closing that out any day now. I hope at some point. Um, and that puts us on finance, Lisa. All right. And then I'm going to give it to Nancy to talk about the transfer, and then we'll motion. Uh, yeah, we're at the end of the year. Um, this transfer is to um, essentially the the largest component of it is to move funds into the out of district placement lines. Um, there's been a significant increase in placements, which we, I don't know if Brad Brooks is still on or if he's not, but we, we ended up discussing that at length um, at the finance subcommittee meeting. And we had the option of, uh, we have the option of taking some funds and applying those for tuition costs for the next fiscal year. So what I've done so far is request from some of the um, collaboratives, their summer tuition bills and uh, since the um, the original motion included a transfer of, of 200,000 into out of district the finance subcommittee asked me to look at doing some an additional 200 so we would have those funds available in that line if we wanted to do a prepayment and if all of the um, the expenses lined and we could we could um, use that for um, offsetting what we already know is an increase for next year for out of district placements. So it's, it's very close to what's in there, but um, there's a couple of different versions and you'll want in the packet. Um, let me see if I can give you a direction on which one it is. 
I have it, Nancy. Okay, great. The revised one. The right? revised transfer on, on June yep. 10th. So are you ready for the motion, Craig? Okay. I move that the committee vote to approve the FY22 budget transfer, $7,000. $941.71 to be added to administration, $16,000 to be added to people services, and $400,000 to be added to payments to out-of-district schools. $219,745.20 to be transferred from in, um, instructional support and $200,000. And four thousand one hundred ninety-six dollars and fifty-one cents from insurance, retirement, and other for a total transfer for of four hundred and twenty-three thousand nine hundred forty-one dollars and seventy-one cents. Did I get it correct? Yes. Okay. Second. Thank you, Tom. Any questions or comments on the transfer? So essentially, our out of district contract, our district school costs were higher than expected, and we're going to do some prepayments for the out of district school costs uh, because we didn't plan, we didn't know about the increases when we put together the budget for next school year. Is that correct? Okay. And the increased costs for clarity, right, were because of additional students utilizing those services, not because the costs themselves went up. Is that a true statement? That is correct. Though some of the costs for next year are not released yet, and I, there could be some minor changes. Right. The biggest chunk and the biggest reason is more students. Right. Yep. All right. Seeing no other questions, uh, this is to approve the budget transfer as presented. Um, Jess. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. I will vote yes, so that is unanimous. Next up, the capital plan review and approval. And then we did a capital plan. Everyone has the summary of the capital plan for FY 2023 in the packet. Is there anything anybody wanted to discuss on it? Or did I need to read all of these, Craig? Oh. You don't need to read every single one, but uh, if anybody has questions, we can certainly talk about specific line items. Then the, the money for this is already in the budget, correct? Like we're not approving money. We're, we're just a, agreeing yeah. as a committee what we want to spend the money on. Correct. Okay. Right. Or these are the projects that are proposed for this next year. Right. And it's it's subtotal based on whether the money is coming from the general fund, from the building project slash borrow for grants or from revolving funds. With half of it coming from the general fund, roughly. All right, does anybody have any questions on the capital plan? All right. So, Jess? Yes. June? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Tom? Yes. Thank you. And I will vote yes. So that is also unanimous. Craig, I do have one comment. Sure. If the next meeting we could in July or have a special meeting in July to focus on ASPE and give a direct plan to what we are doing as a school committee to the town of Ashby and to the residents so everyone knows what is going forward. Is that yep. okay? Yeah, we can work to get that scheduled. Absolutely. I will, um, I think between the evaluation, <clears throat> our normal meeting and that, um, we may need 
two meetings in July. Um, so I'll send out a poll to see what uh, folks' availability is. Thank you. Thank you. We could use a Google survey thing. Yep. Um, all right, anything else on finance, Lisa? We are good. Uh, Tom, anything on uh, negotiation? Assume you're good. Nothing at the moment. Thank you. And policy, Randy. Uh, really quick, we have uh, three policies for first reading. We have JJH-R student travel regulations. Uh, this is, we had made the exception for the uh, baseball team, I think it was. Um, and basically we just put in a line saying that at the discretion of the superintendent, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I, if you lose me, I forgive, forgive me. I just got a message that my internet is unstable. Um, but anyway, uh, so we put in a line on there uh, at discretion of the superintendent that for uh, um, district owned vehicles uh, in the local area, they would be approved for either overnight or for uh, um, late night travel. Um, with KF and KF-R1, both of those policies, we put in uh, comments about no pets allowed on, on school property at any time. And so for the community use, we wanna make sure that uh, especially dogs, uh, but other animals uh, are not allowed on our grounds um, or in their schools. Uh, those are the two, those are the changes that we made to those. Uh, so I would uh, move that the school committee approve the following policies for a first reading as presented, JJH-R, student travel regulations, KF, uh, school facility use, uh, uh, and then KF-1 school, oh, sorry, a rental and person, personnel fees, no, it's not the fee schedule, it's just the uh, facility use. The dash one is the community use of school facilities, I'm sorry, the titles are slightly off. Um, the piece schedule is the E1. So it's just the KF and the KF-1 and the JJH-R. Sorry. Second. Did you? Uh, any questions or comments on the policies for first reading? All right. Jess? <clears throat> Yes. June? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I will vote yes. Anything else on policy, Randy? That's all. All right. Thank you. Uh, any other business from anybody? Then I'll take a motion to adjourn. Move. Move. Second. Second. Mr. So Tom, thank you. So uh, to adjourn, Jess? Yes. June? Yes. Lisa? Yes. Randy? Yes. Susan? Yes. Tom? Yes. And I'll vote yes. So we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Good night. Bye. Bye.